I perceived these things. This is what I saw. I never say in the story, I never claim that I believe that UFOs and unidentified flying objects and aliens are real in the sense that you and I are real. What I say is it seemed real to me, and that is, that is the truth. It did seem very real to me. Yes. But everyone who will read the book will be very skeptical. You can I don't that. agree with you. Uh, I don't think that... depends on who you are. Uh, and also what you mean by skepticism. Uh, people who have had this experience, and there are a lot of them, aren't going to be that skeptical. They know that an extraordinary thing can happen, and sometimes in the night. And second, if we're talking about perceptions, which is what we are talking about, then what does skepticism really mean? I mean, are you trying, would, would it be someone trying to say to me that I didn't have these perceptions? I did have them. I can take, I've taken now two lie detector tests about it, one for the book and one, another one for the BBC, and uh, I, I can pass any test. I, I saw these things, they, it, but what they were, I don't know. My perception was that these small beings, about three or so feet tall, came into the room and uh, it carried me out forci forcibly. A and that perception is very vivid. The, I mean, vivid in the sense not that a dream is vivid, but much more in the sense that life is vivid. Even though, as I said before, the way I felt was not the way I feel now. My body was tingling. I was uh, semi-mobile. I wasn't really able to move my arms and legs. Uh, I was terribly confused by the speed with which things were happening. So I wouldn't say I was in a normal state of mind at all. Yeah. Did they come into your house then? Into my bedroom, yeah. But I woke up and f saw one of them. They made noises. There was noise downstairs. And I woke up and saw one of them standing in the doorway of the bedroom. I became terribly nervous, upset, irritable, afraid of my own shadow, uh, unable to sleep deeply enough to really be healthy, uh, distraught. I reacted like someone who had been attacked, raped, uh, assaulted. What did they look like? What did they look like? <laughs> well, certainly nothing like you. Uh, uh, and you should consider yourself fortunate in, that, in this case. Back in 1983, something odd happened here that we relate to this now, although at the time we just described it to a peculiar event, which was a small white thing, about this, about three feet tall, two and a half to three feet tall, first appeared in the middle of the night and poked my wife in the stomach and woke her up and startled her, frightened her. We thought it was a nightmare, of course. Then a couple nights later it happened to me. I assumed that I had had a nightmare because of her nightmare. <laughs> And, however, our little boy, who was then four, uh, we had told nothing about this. And a few nights later, he woke up with the same apparent dream. And at that point, we became concerned that something a little odd was happening. Then the next thing we knew, uh, he had had a babysitter one afternoon. And the babysitter had seen this little white thing standing on the... Uh, on the fire escape outside the kitchen window and had been so terrified by it that she had uh, she had uh, called her mother to come help her we don't know what that was they came back a year later and I had another interaction with them that was somewhat similar to the one in December of 80, 85 except that the difference was that I went with them voluntarily this time because I was less, less afraid And that experience was really quite real. It, it was m much more like real life than anything that has sub than anything that happened subsequently. How was it? Well, uh, they woke me up, and I had an automatic camera by the bedside and a tape recorder, and I tried to take them with me, and my hands just went away. Uh, uh, in other words, involuntarily, and they. They moved behind me and they were able to make me walk as they wished out, out the house. And I remained with them for about 10 minutes and then was returned to the house. And uh, it's hard for me to believe that that wasn't a real experience, very hard. Did you ever touch them? They, yes, I, they touched me. But, touched but did me. you touch them? 
Have I touched them? No. I haven't, in other words, had enough ability to move voluntarily when I was with them to touch them. Did you smell them? Yes, I've smelled them. Uh, on December the 26th of 85, I was desperate for some confirmation. I wanted to know where I stood. Was this real or was I locked in some kind of a psychotic uh, trap? And I yelled out at one point uh, when they asked me how they could, how, what they could do to m make me stop screaming. I said, you could let me smell you. Because I couldn't believe what I was hearing and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And did they smell you? I don't know. No. Did they have noses? I don't know. I don't remember. I remember a sort of suggestion. I asked them why they had come here, and they said, we saw a glow. Uh, I asked them what the earth is. They said, it's a school. Uh, provocative, strange answers. Not terribly informative. But they were talking English then? They spoke English, and I found from experience that everyone who comes into contact with them finds that they are proficient in whatever language that the person is most comfortable with. How difficult is it for you to talk about these experiences? It's difficult because I'm aware of the fact that I'm not believed by the intellectual elite and uh, that they, they choose to laugh at me in order to uh, hide their own fear of the fact that I may be telling the truth. And I find that painful. I also find discussing these visitors th that they might be real difficult because they're so powerful and so strange and keep themselves so secret if they are real. And I find all three of those things rather unsettling. Some of my neighbors at this point in my house have seen things coming to the house. Other neighbors have been involved, have been pulled in with the visitors and all of this before communion was published when none of them knew anything about it uh, and this was all done as as a result of my question uh, my request you could help me fear you less there are a lot of things like that the two triangles on my arms the on my arm which slowly disappeared by the way there's no evidence of them now uh, did someone see them yeah sure a number of people saw them my wife saw them uh, uh, my doctor saw the remains of them. Uh, uh, some, some other friends, witnesses saw them. They were seen by a number of people. The other issue, uh, there were intrusions into my nose with some sort of a probe that also happened to my wife and son. And my doctor saw the injury that was caused by that in my case. And what it was, was a, was a cut way up inside my nostril, which he said it could have been from anything. There was no, he says, as he put it, there's no evidence that this was cut was made by an alien needle, but I certainly don't know how it got there. Okay. But you had the impression that it was done by an alien needle. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night when that particular thing was happening. I couldn't move. I couldn't open my eyes, and yet I was conscious. I heard stealthy movement around me. I couldn't even tell whether I was in my bed or not. I was lying on something, but I didn't feel like I had covers over me. And I could feel something moving in my uh, nose, in my left nostril. And then there was a sudden cracking noise between my eyes, inside my head. And uh, that's all I remember until the next morning when I woke up with a, with a sore nose. I mean, so that's, that's all I really know about it. There are two possibilities, I think. Either the visitors were actually there, or your mind was creating something that was very close to reality. Yes. But if I ask you, how can we ever be sure? You have to say, we can never be sure. I have to say, it's, not only can we not be sure now, but it must be kept in question. Because if it isn't kept in question, then you fall into the trap of belief. This question of exactly what happens to cause a person to believe that something so extraordinarily strange has taken place and even to involve other witnesses and physical marks on their body. Is it visitors, real visitors in the real physical world? Is something coming to us from somewhere between dream and reality, from another universe, from out of ourselves in some way that we just never understood would be possible before? These things are all unknown.
Some people will say it's a good streamer trick because it brought him a million dollars. I don't really care. I'm not interested in discussing it on that level. In what way has it affected your life? How different a man are you now? It would be easier to answer the question in what way it has, hasn't it affected my life? Because it has affected my life in every conceivable way. It changed all of us. It made us stronger. It made us a closer family. Uh, it renewed and strengthened my, deepened my relationship with both my wife and son. It was a very strengthening experience, even though it was an extremely difficult one. Throughout the world, there is a certain type of face, a, a being that's seen again and again and again with a long, thin face and big black eyes. Sometimes the head seemed quite big, as in the Betty Andreasen case. Others, like in my case, they seem smaller and the beings are taller. But that basic configuration, that basic sort of non-human configuration, seems to be repeated again and again and again in uh, experiences all over the world. The book Communion is about much more than the beings. It also profiles Whitley and his family fighting to keep their sanity under some pretty bizarre circumstances. A common thread among abduction victims is that often the victim's child may also have had the same experience. And in the Streber household, this proved to be the case. I was sleeping and suddenly these lights came, a light, a big bright light came in my room. And sometimes my dad comes in to see how I'm doing in the middle of the night, but he doesn't bring in, he doesn't bring in the searchlight, so. I'm sleeping, and I get scared. I think it's a burglar or something, so I pull the covers over my head and sink down. And then the covers, and then something pulls it down, and I see the face that's on communion. The cabin and its grounds, where most of these unusual events continue to take place, were open for the encounters of the fourth kind film crew, with Mr. Streber serving as host. When they come here, we often hear a sound immediately above the house that will, that will come across into this area. And uh, uh, myself and a number of other people have seen things hanging over this deck or hanging in, in an immediate little clearing in the front yard, very small things but quite large ones sometimes hanging over the deck. In December of 1985, when the visitors first took me, they carried me down through these woods, which I remember very vividly, to a clearing uh, not too far from here, where I have since built a stone circle that I and the group of people who've had experiences here go to, to meditate at night. The strange occurrences outside the Streber cabin can only be compared to what happened inside. But this is where I was sleeping on the night of December the 26th, uh, 1985, when the visitors came in from the door across the room, and the next thing I knew, I was being literally carried out of the room in a state of paralysis. When we return, we'll go behind the scenes for the making of the film, Communion, with its star, Christopher Walken. I said to Whitley the other day that I had never had uh, such an experience, or really anything, including deja vu, right? That's not something that happens to me. And uh, I said that I had, you know, I'd never had anything like that. And he looked at me very seriously and he said, well, you're about to. When the film version of Strieber's best-selling book went before the cameras in June of 1988, those involved with making the picture knew that this was to be more than a movie about little green men from outer space. Those other films were um, fantasies, and Whitley is, uh, this is a true story. That's what, what makes this picture different. It's a true story, and it really examines the psychological side of what will happen to human beings if and when they encounter intelligent non-humans. After Mora convinced Streber that his story should be told on the big screen, the two formed their own production company and set about finding the actors who would play the two pivotal roles. Selected to play Whitley was Academy Award winner Christopher Walken. Walken, whose gritty work in The Deer Hunter earned him an Oscar, quickly adapted himself to stepping into the shoes of the famous writer. The, the good 
the good thing for me here is that I, I, I like to work a lot and I took a job and uh, you know I hope for the best always but in this case it, it turned out to be very inventive which I'm grateful for and uh, Whitley is uh, responsible for that because he you know he was kind of like a good parent you know he let the bird fly equally as important as the role of Whitley was the question as to who would play Anne Streber, Whitley's wife. To fill this role, the director looked to actress Lindsay Krause, an Academy Award nominee for her role in Places of the Heart. And, and another interesting thing about Lindsay is that she was very uh, proud to be playing a wife. In other words, she was very keen on showing that there's a value in keeping the family together and that even though it looked as if her husband was going completely off the rails with the most cockamamie story she's ever heard being abducted by little green and blue men she still had faith in the marriage and in the family like the rest of the book Strieber insisted the recreation of the beings be as close as possible to what he saw in real life special effects whiz Mike McCracken was assigned the task of creating the unusual beings Whitley had a series of illustrations developed and from this we scaled up from those and so that what we have is accurate to within a half inch uh, in terms of the height and the size. The uh, movements and so on are also very accurate or as accurate as it's possible to do with, with current technology. The colors and so on are very, very close to what, to what Whitley saw. In none of these are, is there too much movement, I mean, in terms of their face and so on. On the blue people, there is a certain amount of movement. They move in an odd way in that their face, there's kind of a, uh, Whitley says that there's kind of a gravity feeling. There's a, they have kind of a grim quality about them. And for those actors inside the costumes, it sometimes proved a long day. Yeah, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work I go, boy. Getting into the costumes was only the beginning of their problems. Once in, they sometimes were required to stay in the outfits for a period of up to 12 hours. This, coupled with working on a hot smoking set and trying to gracefully abduct Christopher Walken from his bed, proved to be a real challenge for the little people. Take after take was shot to allow Philippe and the editors a wide choice to use to convey this integral part of the film. The Kraken's work was still not done, however. The most important visitor still had to be designed. Because it would be impossible to fit a human into the skinny body of this being, McCracken had to figure out a different way for the beings to move. What we did then is go back to some of the original ways of making films, which, uh, which are actual, actually seem to be low-tech, but are very appropriate for, for the circumstance, which namely just wires, flying them with wires. It creates problems filmically in terms of hiding the wires and so on, but uh, uh, for this, because, of the, because it was very carefully controlled and so on, it just worked, worked great. And so what did Mr. Streber think of Mr. McCracken's final creations? When he saw the communion figure for the first time, and saw it moving, uh, it was like his, it was like he, his, suddenly his face just went white. He had a shocked look on his face. And uh, it took him, I sense that it took him like the rest of the day to recover from this. So it was that, there was kind of, there was a kind of trauma even in seeing the, uh, the reproduction of the figure. Strieber believes there might be more to the being's face than what appears to the naked eye. A possibility that is explored with some thought-provoking scenes in the film. Ultimately though, Communion, the film, is more than just a look at the uninvited guests visiting the Strieber household. So the film is very much about a family under pressure and how the family sticks together under the stress of these incredible events. So the story is about a family, and uh, that's dramatized, uh, that's, that's come up very well. Uh, it's not a special effects picture. It's much more a picture about uh, human emotions, and it's really a psychological thriller about someone who thinks they're going crazy.
well, it was wonderful because we woke up upstairs and we heard them all talking. And when we came down, they'd been talking for hours. It was just magical. It was like coming in right after a miracle. This is the couch where a reporter was sleeping last May, May of 1988. Uh, when the visitors came into this room, there were two other people in the room at the same time. They were all simultaneously awakened by the ruckus and the noise. As my son says, the visitors are noisy when they are around here. They certainly don't creep around. They couldn't move, these people, and they all had various experiences with the visitors right here in this room. Joining the Strieber family that May was a host of friends, including Raven Dana, Dora Ruffner, and Colleen Langley. Also invited along were several reporters, including newspaper reporter Ed Conroy, and a reporter we'll call Mark, who chose not to talk to us about his experiences. If people knew what Mark had experienced here, that it was this person, he would be, his career would be ruined. And you got, you got a guy's career on the line, he can't show up here and become, go public. I think, it's a, I think it's a crying shame that he can't, because he had a beautiful, beautiful thing happen to him. But others were willing to talk. The fellow who had been uh, sleeping, it was like a fold-out couch, and I was on a cot next to him, uh, he set up very abruptly and he said did did you see that or did you hear that and I and I and at that moment this field broke and I could move up until that time I was just totally paralyzed but I could move and I said to him well yes I heard you know I heard the uh, the voices what he described was of, of also waking up hearing that garbled voice and footsteps as though something was approaching the foot of his bed and then he experienced paralysis he couldn't move he was fully conscious and he was very annoyed because he had wanted validation he had asked for validation and here it was but he couldn't see them to determine if there was more to the story than what the witnesses could consciously remember hypnotist Fred Max who had taken Betty Andreasen through her hypnotic regressions was called upon to hypnotize the cabin visitors of May 1988 I do regressions. I see people who have had UFO encounters, people who wish to remember events previous in their life. And for these people, we call back that period of time because everything we've done is still in our head. And it's a matter of guiding that person back to that point in time. As the regressions began, it was evident that more had happened that night in May than was previously thought. Tell me what you're feeling. Why? Because something stands behind me and doesn't want me to move. Are you seeing anything else? Seeing the stone circle. Okay. And what is that? Stone circle is a little stone hinge behind the cabin. I feel a lot of fear and I also feel this really exquisite feeling. It's incredible. They feel they have been abducted. They may have been abducted. I'm reasonably comfortable they're not fabricating stories. And the similarities are intriguing. Something unusual happened at the Strieber cabin that night, but what was revealed in the regressive sessions appeared to be only the tip of the iceberg. So, the production crew of Encounters of the Fourth Kind waited with cameras in hand to try and capture the elusive visitors on tape. When the sun rose the following morning, the Encounters TV crew was disappointed to find nothing but black darkness on the videotape that ran throughout the entire night while they slept. 
The beings were nowhere to be seen. Or were they? A very small, well, about maybe four feet high being with very round, very dark eyes came through the window. And the most interesting thing was that I, there was no real fear, just at first a jolt of shock, but I felt in tremendous rapport with the being who raised his hand, his right hand. And I felt the weight lift just slightly from my body. I kind of propped myself up on my arm, and I also lifted my hand. And we touched palms. It's no secret in this it, that something happened in here last night. But you have no physical validation. All you have is a roll of film is just totally black with a few funny noises on it. Big deal. So uh, what am I to say? Except that you personally, as a human being, know something happened, but you can't validate it. 